Hello friends, I'm Will Michael and you're watching The Connecticut Naturalist. It's now December and at this time of year it's difficult to find animals to film. All the reptiles and amphibians are hibernating. There's a lot of animal tracks in the snow and I've been following some turkey tracks and they're leading me up on top of this ridge just behind the camera. So I'm going to walk up there now and stake out the territory and we'll see what we can find. Here's the turkey footprints in the snow. We'll follow their trail and see where they lead. I'm going to hide out behind this stump for a while and observe this open area. Hopefully we'll find something. This open field is the perfect spot for viewing animals. If anything shows up, I'll have a clear shot. Our first sighting of the day is a chickadee. No luck yet. I've been sitting out here for a while. No turkeys, no animals, a few birds in the trees. But by the time I get the camera set up, they've already flown away. We're going to go back, and I know a place where we're guaranteed to find some animals. As I'm walking back through the forest, I noticed an unusual tree. The branches are covered with a certain type of growth. From the forest floor, the shadows look similar to leaves, but all of those circular shapes are of fungal growth that has taken over the tree. Here's one of the galls that fell to the ground. I don't know exactly what the fungus is, but it forms these hard tumor-like growths on the branches. They're as hard as the bark of the tree, and they choke the vascular tissue of the branches, eventually killing the tissue. Next to the gall cover tree is a dead ironwood that woodpeckers have been working on. The snow is covered with sawdust. You can see that the woodpeckers have been busy at this spot. Here's one last look at all those growths high up in the branches. Here's a nice pond for ice skating in a woodland setting. I'm still on my way to the location where I know I'll find some animals, but high up in the branches of this tree growing in the swamp is a white-faced hornet nest. All summer and fall, the leaves were hiding this hive, but now that it's winter and the leaves have fallen, the secret of this tree is revealed. White-faced hornets are an aggressive wasp. They're large and black with a white head. I was lucky I wasn't stung during the summer or spring while walking around this tree. That's a beautiful hive, and the hornets have abandoned it for the winter. I'm going to attempt to climb this tree and get a closer look. Let's see how this tree looks for climbing. Well, the branches are sparse, and it looks a long way up but I think I can do it. This is Tree Climbing 101. Using computer editing technology, I sped up this footage to capture the journey up and down the tree. In reality, it took me about 15 minutes. Climbing a tree with few horizontal branches is difficult because you have to constantly grip the vertical trunk of the tree. There's no rest, you're constantly fighting gravity, even when remaining stationary to catch your breath. I retrieved the hornet nest and now I'm on my way back down. At one point, my foot got stuck in the V where two branches meet. 
I almost gave up, but I was confident in my climbing ability. Whew. Don't try that at home. Here's a look at that white-faced hornet hive that I just got out of the tree. And I'm exhausted now. That tree took a lot more than I thought. But here's the hive. Each little chamber houses a larva. The, har the larva have all developed. Look how smooth the outside is. All layers and layers of this paper-like substance. And it's connected to this tree branch on the top. The white-faced hornets are master architects. I'm here at my bird feeding station and I have a bird feeder. Now I've put a lot of seeds out and at this time of year or at any time of year we're never short of squirrels and the squirrels take more seeds than the birds do. But tomorrow morning we'll set our camera up and we'll see what visits our station here. The feeding station is the only place I could guarantee to find animals. In the forest, you can never be 100% positive that wildlife will appear. Here in my yard, the squirrels dominate the feeder. In Connecticut, we have gray squirrels and red squirrels. As you can see, this is a gray squirrel. Squirrels are helpful to trees because they bury nuts in the forest. They cannot remember where they bury their reserve food. They retrieve the nuts by smell. Often, they never find the buried cache, and the nuts planted in the forest sprout into young saplings. Gray squirrels feed primarily on nuts. They have a symbiotic relationship with some of the nut-producing trees. The red oak acorn germinates much better underground than above ground and it is estimated that 95% of all hickory trees come from nuts planted by squirrels. Gray squirrels shed their coats twice a year, first in late spring and then again in early autumn. However, the fur of the tail is shed only once a year during midsummer. The gray squirrel and the red squirrel have many differences in their lifestyles. In future episodes, we'll be exploring them in detail. But now let's see what else shows up at our feeding station. A small flock of tufted titmice also frequent the bird feeder. The tufted titmouse is common at feeders during the winter. Here's a shot of a titmouse eating a sunflower seed in the branches of a cedar tree. Unfortunately, its back is towards the camera. The back is gray and its ventral side is white with pale orange flanks. It's the 20th of December and Christmas is just five days away. The squirrels are busy outside, but if you remember the poem, The Night Before Christmas, there's a line that reads, not a creature was stirring, not even a mouse. But here, some mice have infiltrated into the greenhouse and have made their way into where I store the bird seeds. Do you allow mice in your house? There's one thing we can all count on. Wherever humans are, mice follow. The lid was partially left off the seed bin and some deer mice treated themselves to a meal. Many people shudder at the sight of a mouse, but what's to be afraid of? Just look at this cute couple. I'd be willing to bet that every house in Connecticut has mice living within its vicinity. One thing you might not know about mice is that they have an extremely high heart rate. If a mouse gets too excited, it can have a heart attack. Mice feed on berries, seeds, plants, and insects. Some people complain about mice, but humans throw away so much food we attract them. In general, people like mice better than rats. Mice are smaller and have softer fur. The rat is larger and has a tail that most people find unsightly. Mice will make nests in the walls of your house. Although these mice are cute, 
they're not good to have indoors. Their waste products contaminate the area and harm the sanitation of your home. I'm not going to hurt these mice because they too have an important role to play in our environment. I'm going to take them outside where they belong. When you stop and think about it, it's amazing how animals such as these mice weather the winter. Not only are the mice scurrying about, but if you remember Leonard the toad from a few episodes past, Leonard is a toad that lives in my greenhouse. And for some reason, this December, or this winter, he has not hibernated. And I think he's up to some unusual business with the Christmas sugar plum fairies. Twas the night before Christmas, and down in the greenhouse, Leonard was hungrier than even a mouse. He called all his friends to come out and dine. There's a feast of grubs, hurry, we haven't much time. Lucky for Leonard, his friends are all vegetarians. How lucky for me, I have no one to share with. Out of my way, you move like dry clay. When hunting for grubs, you must sneak every step of the way. His friends were offended. They were all tired and midnight had just ended. But Leonard wasn't happy. He wanted more. He wanted to eat two grubs times four. His friends started talking and whispering words. Please quiet or I will be heard. He sneaked and he crept. He licked and he leapt. With each delicious swallow, his stomach felt less hollow. Don't eat too much, Leonard, all his friends cried. Remember last year, you had no room for auntie's mosquito pie. But Leonard didn't listen, he was too deep in his mission. For each stealthy step was another grub's death. I say to all of those who are watching tonight, don't bother hiring exterminators, their rates are too high. Call me anytime to solve your insect woes. I make sure the job is done once and is done right. Now I say to all the insects of old, watch out for me or anyone who recites the ode of Leonard the Toad. Leonard's eyes were aglow. This feast was his own. His belly grew plump. By this time tomorrow, I won't be able to even jump. His friends all asked, it's late in the year, Leonard. Shouldn't you be preparing for your long winter nap? Why, my good friends, sleep is the enemy. It is not my delight. While snoring away, how could I quench my insatiable appetite? When the last grub was quelched, Leonard laughed to himself. While all the people are asleep, I'll creep into the kitchen and share a cookie with Saint Nick. When Leonard finally rests, he jumps into this potting soil here. And under this leaf, I found him. There he is. You see that he used his back legs and he dug a small burrow. <laughs> and he sees me now, so he's a little scared. But we'll cover him back over and he can sleep there for as long as he wants. He has a safe place. You'd never guess that in this box of potting soil is a sleeping toad. A few days have passed since I was out looking at the turkey tracks in the snow. Now all the snow is melted, so maybe we'll have better luck trying to find some bird activity. While I'm setting up my camera in a place where I think we'll find some woodpeckers, stay tuned for a Connecticut naturalist trivia question. Hello friends, I'm Azizi Kayama with this week's trivia question. Have you ever opened a door to an abandoned trailer and have been chased by an angry swarm of wasps? If you have, you may be able to identify this hive. You may commonly find these in outdoor sheds around your property. They lay eggs in these holes and the larva develops here. Stay tuned and I'll be right back to identify this interesting wasp. 
Azizi will return with the answer to the question in a few minutes. Now it's on to the woodpeckers. Our first sighting is a downy woodpecker. I've returned to the same place from the beginning of the show. Today is a nicer day. The sun is shining and most of the snow has melted. The downy woodpecker is the smallest woodpecker in Connecticut. They are members of the ladderback family of woodpeckers. As you'll see on the plumage of the back, the black and white color has a ladder-like pattern. Males are distinguished from females by the presence of red feathers on the back of their head, or nape. Females lack the red and have only the black and white coloring on the nape. A female is seen here. Today the number of downy woodpeckers is overwhelming. I've never seen so many in one area at one time. The female downy lays four to seven eggs in the hollow of a tree. The eggs are incubated for about two weeks. The young leave the nest just over three weeks after hatching. A second brood is often raised. The downy woodpecker has a short beak. You'd think that a woodpecker would have a long beak, but not the downy. Here we have a male downy. Notice the red feathers on the back of the head. These birds are less timid than others. They allow me to approach relatively close without flying away. The downy makes a high-pitched chirp. When excited, they release several rapid chirps in succession. This male is searching for insects on a branch that is entangled by bittersweet vines. Sometimes it's difficult to film because the camera automatically focuses on the branches instead of the subject that I'm aiming. Eventually I'll upgrade to a camera with more manual features. Remember that pile of sawdust from the beginning of the episode? That's one reason you don't want woodpeckers on your house. This female is looking for lunch in the planks of the old field house in the old quarry nature center. Now we'll move on to a cousin of the downy. The hairy woodpecker looks similar to the downy. Both are black and white. Males have the red plumage in both species. The distinguishing characteristic between the two is size. Hairy woodpeckers are larger than downies. They're about double their size. They also have a much larger beak. It's amazing how strong the beak and neck of these birds are. Look at the force that each blow to the tree is delivered with. The hairy woodpecker is common to mature forests with large trees. When breeding, they excavate a hole high up in a dead tree. The same cavity is often used year after year for raising young. The male incubates the eggs at night and the female during the day. A similar pattern of breeding is followed by the hairy and the downy. After two weeks of incubation, the eggs which are solid white, hatch. After four to five weeks, the juveniles leave the nest. Besides searching for food, woodpeckers will drum on trees as a way of claiming their territory. Now we're on to our next woodpecker. This is the red-bellied woodpecker. They are larger than the hairy. The red-bellied woodpecker used to be absent in our area. In recent years, it has extended its range to our area and is pushing northward. This male has found a supply of wood-boring insects. If you look closely, 
you'll see what appears to be a beetle-like insect being extracted from the bark of the tree. Female red bellies lay eggs in the hollow of a tree. Usually four to six eggs are laid. After about two weeks, the eggs hatch. Three to four weeks after hatching, the fledglings leave the nest, but they remain with their parents for some time. The red belly also eats fruit and seeds, as well as insects. The name red-bellied may be confusing. It has the name red-bellied because it has reddish tints to the underparts of its belly amongst the white feathers. The downy and hairy woodpeckers are extremely common. The red-bellied is slightly more elusive to capture on film. While I was filming the woodpeckers, I luckily saw a flock of eastern bluebirds flying about the area. This bluebird doesn't look blue from this angle because only the dorsal side is blue. The ventral side is white and the front of the chest is orange. The blue color is brilliant, but if I approach from behind, I'll startle the bird and he'll fly away. So remember, the three types of woodpeckers filmed today were the downy woodpecker, the hairy woodpecker, and the red-bellied woodpecker. Someday I hope to find a pileated woodpecker, which is the largest in Connecticut. Now while I'm packing up my camera, stay tuned for the answer to the trivia question with Azizi Kayama. Hi, I'm back with the answer for this week's question. This is the work of the mud dauber wasp. The mud dauber wasp uses sand and mud to create this masterwork of architecture. In case you were wondering, I got this hive in the fall after the wasp had left the hive for the winter. I'm Azizi Kayalam and I'll see you soon. Goodbye. It's now December 28th and I'm standing on the edge of Revolution Pond. As you see behind me, the pond is covered with a layer of ice. The edge of the pond has only a thin layer which allows me to peer through and see what creatures are active. So I'm going to take a walk around and I'll show you what we can see through the ice. There's a thin layer of ice covering the pond. But underneath the ice, insects and red spotted newts are still active. I'm filming through the ice. Here's a red spotted newt swimming. Some species of amphibians can tolerate the cold better than others. The object that is moving across the screen is a caddisfly larva. It's extremely camouflaged. This looks like a small pine cone. The caddisfly used material from the pond floor to build a shell. If you didn't know what you were looking for, or if the larva was remaining still, you'd never know this is a living insect. Each species of caddisfly makes a specific type of shell. As the larvae grow, they may simply enlarge their shell or abandon it and build a new case. Most larvae feed on underwater vegetation, but there are few types that are predaceous. When the larva is full grown, it attaches itself to an underwater object and seals off the hole in its case. It pupates inside. The pupa has well-developed mandibles and chews a hole in the case. It then crawls out of the water and undergoes its final molt on land, becoming an adult. Some species emerge on the surface of the water. Here's a good look at another species of caddisfly. This type is much larger. Here's a water boatman. These beetles swim upside down. As he swims under the ice, the light refracts at different angles, distorting its image. It looks like something out of the cartoon Fantasia. Here's a comical shot. This diving beetle is walking upside down under the ice. I've never seen anything like this before. This caddisfly made a shell out of a leaf. You can see that it's soft just like a leaf. 
It's extremely camouflaged in the water, though. And it's tubular, and the larva hides inside. We've had caddisflies on the show before, but each caddisfly is unique because their shells are made differently. Different materials are used. This one made it out of a leaf. I've had some made it, make their shells out of small stones. They have a glue that they can excrete. It holds the leaf or the stones together. But this is a beautiful specimen here. Even in the winter, this ice-covered pond is teeming with life. So that caddisfly is extremely camouflaged, as you see in this shot. He's made his shell from leaves, and he lives amongst the leaves, fallen to the bottom of the lake. So if you're looking for a needle in a haystack, try looking for a leaf in a pile of leaves. So remember, even in the water of an ice-covered pond, wildlife can still be observed if you have a good eye and know where to look. Now we'll say goodbye to the pond and we'll be back again in the future. Now we're off to our next adventure. Being that it's the Christmas season, I've been on the lookout for the most unique Christmas tree. It turns out I found it right in the center of Danbury. So we temporarily leave behind the forest to take a look at this special tree. I found the tallest Christmas tree in Connecticut. Behind me is a bucket loader and North America equipment put a Christmas tree way up on top. This is what makes the holiday season special. When people are creative, it brings happiness to the entire community. When you're driving around Danbury, you can look over the horizon and see this tree suspended in the sky. At night, it's even better. The arm of the bucket loader is hidden in the dark and it looks as though the tree is floating in midair. I wonder, do any birds perch on this tree? It's now December 31st, the last day of the year. It's also the end of this week's episode. Stay tuned in weeks to come as we continue to explore winter wildlife in our Connecticut forests. I'm Will Michael, and thanks for watching The Connecticut Naturalist. Tired of sitting on the ground I don't want to live in the shade I want to stand up tall and spread my wings I want to feed the birds out of my head See the view without standing on tiptoes. I want to see the light. I want to feel the light. I want to see the light. I want to feel the light. To be the tallest tree in all the world. Smile high, touch the sky. Swing.